Well, good morning. Thank you, Tony, Sarah, for leading us and praises to our God. Well, if you would turn to Psalm 46, and as you're turning there, just a word. Um, uh, as I mentioned last week, Pastor Knight has begun a time of a sabbatical, a time to try to get some rest. And uh, I just wanted to offer, uh, on behalf of myself, the elders, the leadership, a thanks to Pastor Knight um, for his, well, years of leadership um, from this pulpit in this church, but certainly over the last several months, um, we're all sorts of unknowns and, and things are happening. Um, things, as he mentioned in a meeting yesterday, that are not taught in seminary classes of how to pastor through a pandemic. But I want to thank him for his leadership. We want to thank him for his guidance and most of all, for his commitment to Christ and, and to his people. It's, it's been exemplary for, for me, for the other elders. Um, and so I want to give him a, a thanks. And as he, uh, as he began a series in the book of Psalms, so we continue in Psalm 46. If you would follow along with me, this is the word of the Lord. Psalm 46, beginning in verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride. Selah. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations made an uproar. The kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has wrought desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots with fire. Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Selah. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we, we thank you for your word. And we ask for your help once again in understanding and applying this word. There is much here for us that we need to understand and that we need to apply. So may you, by your spirit, O oh God, guide us into your truth. And may you be glorified by your truth, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing, our helper, he amid the flood, of mortal ills prevailing. We just sung those words, words that were written some 470 years ago by a German pastor who had learned a thing or two about trusting God in the midst of overwhelming trouble, overwhelming opposition. Martin Luther, as many of you know, had been a, a pious, Roman Catholic Augustinian monk for several years, albeit a, a monk constantly wallowing in despair over his inability to keep God's law, his inability to love God even. And yet, as he began to read and to study scripture for himself, God graciously gave him the light of the gospel, of the glory of Jesus Christ and, and freed him from his burden, freed him from his sins. And so after that moment, Luther studied and he preached 
And he wrote about this glorious gospel of justification by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And for his preaching and for his writing, he was declared a heretic by the Roman Catholic Church. He was called to recant of his beliefs, of his writings. He was threatened with execution for standing firm on this gospel message. He faced tremendous opposition, opposition, and yet he stood by Scripture. He stood by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And God providentially protected his life for many years. And, and Luther and those who stood with him for the same gospel message, it spread throughout Europe in this movement that we now call the Reformation. But all the while, Luther and those with him faced tremendous opposition, tremendous adversity and trouble. The gospel that they preached, that was taught in Scripture, was constantly in danger, at least from a worldly perspective, of being snuffed out, of being kept from the people. And Luther knew that though they faced great human opposition behind that, there was an even greater power, which we also sung about, the, the power of the enemy, the evil one. Satan himself was behind this opposition, this adversity to those who would declare the true gospel. And yet, instead of despairing, Luther and those with him took confidence from Scripture. And in particular, Luther took confidence from Psalm 46. That's why he wrote a song based on Psalm 46. That's what we just sung. He took confidence from Psalm 46 because in this psalm, the truth is boldly declared that no matter the opposition that we face, no matter how big the trouble, God is bigger. God is our mighty fortress, a bulwark never failing. Luther knew that the only way this gospel would succeed and would go forth was by God's power, not anything we could do or he could do. It was by God's power alone. And he also knew that the only way the church would be preserved and would grow would be if God was present with his people. And that's what this psalm is about. God's presence with his people. So that whatever the circumstance, whatever the trouble, we don't need to fear. For our sovereign God is with us. That's what Psalm 46 teaches us. And it's laid out in three sections, you could see separated by these say laws. Three clear sections that, that show us really three pictures that teach us three lessons. The first picture is a, is a picture really of, of natural disasters of epic proportions. And the lesson that we learn there in verses one through three from that picture of natural disasters is the lesson that God's presence is our confidence amid disaster. The second picture that we see in verses four through seven is a picture of, of an army besieging a city or, or surrounding a city. And the lesson that we're taught there is that God's presence is our security against our enemies. But then the third picture we see in verses 8 through 11 is a picture of, of ultimate victory in battle. And the lesson that we're taught there is that God's presence is our peace. For he will be victorious over all. God's presence is our confidence, our security, and our peace. Well, let's look at this first picture and, and look at this first lesson that God's presence is our confidence amid disaster. This, this psalmist who we're, we're told in the superscription was, was one of the sons of Korah opens this song, this psalm, this song with a, with a declaration, a bold confession of confidence in God that, that, that just permeates the rest of the psalm. He says, God is our refuge 
and strength, a very present help in trouble. So the first thing we see here is confidence in God's character. This psalm is about confidence in God because of who he is. But in particular, it's not just about who God is in and of himself, but about who God is to us, who God is to his people, to us, to his people, the psalmist declares, God is refuge, God is strength, God is help. Let's look briefly at each one of these confessions. First, God is our refuge. God is a refuge to his people, to those who believe in him, to those who belong to him. God is our refuge. It's a, it's a word we've seen over and over again um, in the Psalms. It's, it's used throughout the Old Testament, but mostly it's used in the Psalms. It's literally a word that means a shelter, a shelter from a storm, shelter from rain, but it's only used literally in the Bible just a couple of times. Almost always this word for refuge is used metaphorically to describe God's protection, God's shelter for his people in times of trouble. God's shelter from, for whatever might threaten those who belong to him. For example, Psalm 61, verse 4. Let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge in the shelter of your wings. But notice that, that in, in that verse I just read, and in Psalm 46, verse 1, God doesn't just provide refuge. What does it say? God is our refuge. He doesn't just provide a refuge for us. He himself is our refuge. We find shelter in God himself. So God is our refuge. But he also then declares, God is our strength. Now, obviously, God himself is, is infinitely strong. The word here is, is, is translated variously in, in English as strength or as power. Same word, but God is infinitely strong. And, and in fact, strength or power is really an, an attribute of God, referring, it's part of his, his omnipotence. He is all powerful. He is all strength. He's, he's what strength is. But here we're told that God himself is not only strong, but he, he provides strength, his own strength to his people. He is our strength. You know, we like to think that we're strong, that we can handle whatever life throws at us, but over and over again, I am proven, you are proven wrong. We're proven to be weak. We're proven to need a strength that is, is outside of ourself. A strength that is not in us inherently, but belongs to God. We need a divine strength. And if you live long enough, and if you are honest enough, that's been proven in your life over and over again. We can't handle everything that life throws at us. We can't handle the opposition that comes at us. We need divine strength. And God, God is strong. And God is strong enough for whatever the situation calls for. He is our refuge. He is our strength. And then finally, in this first declaration, he is our help, a very present help in trouble. You could go a lot of places where it talks about God being the help of his people. Psalm 22, verse 20. Psalm 27, verse 9. 63, verse 7. 94, verse 17. We could go a lot of other places where we are told that God is our help. But here we're told something more specific even. God is our very present help. Or you could translate it, God is an ever-present help. Literally, God is a help that can always be found. Always available kind of help. When people are in trouble, God is available. God is always present when trouble or distress of, or adversity of any kind comes. Now, that doesn't mean that God's not always present, right? God is omnipresent. He is always present. But isn't it true that in times of trouble or distress or adversity, 
That's when we especially see our need for God's presence. And so often when we're in those situations, God makes himself felt especially close, especially near to us. His presence is particularly close to us so that we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that in this situation, in this overwhelming difficulty, this disaster, God is with us. God is with me. He's like a, like a watchful parent um, who takes perhaps your toddler. Many of you have done this, taking your toddler to the park, perhaps when they were youngsters, um, some of you who are older parents like me. Um, but take your, your kid to the park and, and you never want to take your eyes off them because they'll run off or you let them go perhaps to the playground and, and they think they have a little bit of independence and they're running around doing things, but, but you never take your eye off them so that if they get in trouble, if they get in a situation where they're hanging from the monkey bars and, and they're stuck and they don't want to drop because the ground is way too far and they start crying for help and you're right there. That's how God is with his people. We don't always notice him. And that's our fault. But he's always watching us. His eyes never leave his people. He is an ever-present, a very present help in trouble. Uh, one Bible commentator, Alan Ross, writes that stating that God is a help is much more forceful than saying that God helps people. It indicates that he so abundantly helps people that he is what help is all about. So God, in a sense, defines help. If you want to know what help looks like, look at God. God is what help is all about. But now put all these things together. God is our refuge. God is our strength. God is our help. What does that imply about us? We're needy. We are very needy people. And it means that we need to humble ourselves and admit as much, admit that we are needy people. I mean, who needs refuge? Us who, who need shelter from a storm, who, who need to be protected, who need safety, who needs rest. Yes, I need refuge. Who needs strength? Those who know and can admit that they're weak. Who needs who needs God to be a, a, a present help for them. Those who are in danger of any kind, those who know that they cannot help themselves. So to be able to say this, to be able to have this kind of confidence in God, you can't be prideful. A prideful person can admit that they need God to be their refuge or their strength or their help. We have to humble ourselves, recognize that we are a needy people. A proud person can't praise God for being a refuge. A proud person can't praise God for being their strength or their help. To praise God for who he truly is to his people, we have to humble ourselves. We have to recognize our need that we're weak that we need his strength, that we need his refuge, that we need his help so that we'll cry out to him. And in fact, isn't it often the case that God even allows adversity, trouble, opposition to come into our lives so that we will see that we need him, so that we will cry out to him, so that we will place confidence in him and not in ourselves? Well, if we can do that, if we can have like this psalmist confidence in God's character, that he's our refuge and our, and our strength and our help, then that's going to lead to something else. That's going to lead to confidence that relieves fear. Verse two, Psalm 46, therefore we will not fear. Because God is our refuge and our strength and our help. We will not fear. No matter the situation we find ourselves in, we don't need to fear because of what God is to us. So that even if the world is in upheaval around us, we don't need to fear. And what the psalmist does here in verses two and three is, is really paint a scary picture of, of natural disaster of epic proportions. 
Some commentators even, even see in the language that he uses here in verses two and three, a, a sort of a reversal of creation itself. The language that's used in Genesis is sort of undone. And he's saying, even if the world comes undone, he says, even if the, the, the earth should change, the earth should, should totter, should move, even if the mountains themselves, he says, should slip into the heart of the sea, if there's massive landslides, perhaps some volcanic eruptions, whatever causes landslides, even, even if, he says, the waters of the sea roar and foam with hurricanes and storms, with tsunamis, even if the mountains quake with its swelling pride, if there are massive earthquakes that, that tear down our homes and cities, even if all of this happens, disaster of epic proportions, like a, like a sci-fi disaster movie, times 100, if the whole earth is collapsing around us, the psalmist says, we will not fear. If there ever were a time to fear anything, it would be, it would be this, right? The normal reaction to you know, natural cosmic upheaval is, is panic. The scariest thing about natural disasters is that we have absolutely no control over them. And they show us how little, how small, and how helpless we really are. Some of you have experienced these things firsthand. I, I, I grew up in Tornado Alley, that, that swath across the Midwest that sees tornadoes all the time. And, and thankfully, I never experienced one that did any damage to our home, but we ran to the basement. My, anytime a tornado was coming, we'd get that warning. My mom would make us go down into the basement. And I was always a little bit angry because I wanted to see it, right? I wanted to videotape it. I almost got one once on video, but I got, anyways. Um, but we could hear it. We could see the, 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 the aftermath of these tornadoes, the destruction they would cause to the trees, to some homes, perhaps, that were near us or in the, the neighboring town. Some of you have, I'm sure, gone through hurricanes. Some of you have experienced earthquakes or other kinds of disasters, but I'm sure you would agree, when those things hit, what can you do? We have absolutely no power to stop, to control these things. Yeah, maybe we can predict and, and track tornadoes a little bit better now. Maybe we can uh, figure out where fault lines are, where earthquakes are likely to occur, but we can't do a thing to stop them or to lessen their power of these disasters. It's no wonder people panic. But the psalmist says here, we will not fear even if all of these things happen at once. We will not fear. Why? He already told us why. Because God is our refuge and our strength and our very present help. As big as these troubles, as big as these disasters are, they're not bigger than God. In fact, God is in complete control over all of these things. He is sovereign over all that he has created, over all the weather patterns and all natural disasters. But of course, these examples, what, what the psalmist gives here, are, are, are sort of the, the worst case scenario of troubles. But we're faced with troubles, with disasters on all different scales, all the time. Pandemics swirling around the world, um, economic recession or depression, disasters in their own right. But perhaps even more relatable to us are those, those personal disasters that we all experience at some point or another. Personal earthquakes, personal tsunamis, the death of someone we love, the, the, the breaking up of a marriage, being diagnosed with some serious medical condition. To us, to me, individually, these things are just as serious as disasters that sweep across the whole world. And yet, when disaster hits on any scale, universal, worldwide, or, or personal, the same principle applies. If God is our refuge, if God is our strength, if God is our help and we run to him, then we do not need to fear 
whatever that disaster is. It doesn't mean we don't use wisdom. You know, if a tornado is coming, we don't run out, fly a kite, and say, God is my refuge. Don't worry. We run down to the basement. God has given us common sense and wisdom. You know, we're driving down the freeway. We buckle our seatbelts. We lock our doors at night, most of us. We use the common sense and wisdom that God has given us. Yet in the end, we have to remember that God is sovereign over it all. He's the one in control. And we have to remember that ultimately, he is our help. He is our strength. He is our refuge, God alone. So God's presence is to be our confidence amid disaster. But the second thing we see here in the psalm, the second lesson that we're taught in verses four through seven, is that God's, God's presence is our security against our enemies. Look again at verse four. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations made an uproar. The kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. See, this, the scene changes here. The picture changes here. We go from a picture of nature falling down around us to, to a picture of, of a city, a city surrounded by her enemies. That's what verse 6 is saying, that the nations made an uproar, the, the kingdoms tottered. This city is being surrounded, besieged by a powerful enemy nation that wants to destroy the city, that wants to destroy the people who are in it. And in fact, some of the same words that were used to describe those natural disasters in verse, verses 2 and 3 are used in verse 6. Same words in the original. So like the roaring sea, so the, the enemy nations roared. They made an uproar, same word. As the mountains slipped or tottered into the sea, so the kingdoms tottered, they slipped, same word, before the powerful armies that were coming against them that were now, now had surrounded this city. But the weird thing is, the weird thing is that although this city is surrounded by a mighty enemy, how's the city described to us? It's, it's peaceful. It's quiet. It's calm. It's, it's glad, we're told. It's, it's described almost as a, as a paradise of sorts. It's abundantly watered by a river, providing all that the people inside the city could need. It's a place that's unmoved, unaffected by the chaos and the wars that raged outside of it. How is that possible? How could a city be calm in the midst of being surrounded by an army? Verse 5 tells us how. God is in the midst of her. See, we see here, this, this is no ordinary city, is it? Yes, in this immediate context, he's talking about Jerusalem. The city of God. It's the city of God because God is in the midst of her. Jerusalem, where, where the temple was built. The temple, where, which was the focus, the center place of worship of the true God, the center place for worship of ancient Israel. It's where God chose to most visibly, intensely dwell on earth. It's where his presence was made known among his people. The city of God, the holy dwelling places where God dwelled, tabernacled among his people. This is where God the Most High dwells. He is present with his people. And because God is present with his people in this city, it will not be moved. Because God is in the midst of her, it cannot be moved because God cannot be moved. And the people in it are calm because they know that the enemy surrounding them, God can deal with in an instant, can he? Verse 6, the nations made an uproar. The kingdoms tottered. What did God do? God raised his voice. The earth melted. God speaks and the whole earth melts. 
That's why this city can be calm and peaceful and glad in the midst of overwhelming opposition on the outside. Because God speaks. One word from God can bring judgment on those who oppose him, on all those who threaten his people. All it takes is a word from God. And the enemy is destroyed and his people are safe. As long as God is present with his people, no enemies, no matter how powerful, could ultimately defeat her. And we have an illustration of this in scripture that I think is pertinent. In fact, some, some uh, scholars think that this was uh, the occasion even for, or the inspiration for writing Psalm 46. It's recorded for us in 2 Kings chapters 18 and 19. I want you to turn there. It's also recorded in Isaiah 36 and 37, same account, but turn to 2 Kings chapter 18 and 19. I want to read just a little bit of this account, just a, a little bit of background first. This is really a, a great illustration of what the psalmist is talking about in Psalm 46. The Assyrian army is on the move. Assyrian army was, was at this point in time, uh, when 2 Kings was written, was describing, was the most powerful army, bar none, on the face of the planet. No one could stand up against the Assyrians, not even the Egyptians. And they were barnstorming through the territory. They had gone through the northern kingdom of Israel, who had already, for the most part, abandoned God. And as part of God's judgment, the Assyrians came in and utterly devastated Israel. And many of them were exiled, and they did not really ever recover from that blow from the Assyrians. And now the Assyrians have turned their sights on the southern kingdom of Judah, and in particular on the capital of Judah, Jerusalem. Hezekiah is king of Judah at this point in time. And we have here in, in chapter 18 of 2 Kings, verses 19 and 20, just a few words from the commander of the Assyrian army, this Rabshakeh. He says in 2 Kings 18, verse 19, then Rabshakeh said to them, to the, 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 the people guarding the walls, they're holed up in Jerusalem while the army surrounds them. This Rabshakeh said to them, say now to Hezekiah, the king, thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, what is this confidence that you have? You say, but they are only empty words, I have counsel and strength for the war. Now on whom do you rely that you have rebelled against me? What confidence did they have? On whom did they rely? God? Well, all the other nations they had already beat up and destroyed, they had their gods too. That's what he says in, in, in verses 33 and 35 of 2 Kings 18. Has any one of the gods of the nations delivered his land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath, of Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim, Hena, and Eva? Have they delivered Samaria from my hand? Who among all the gods of the lands have delivered their, fan, their land from my hand? That the Lord should deliver Jerusalem from my hand. He's saying... All those other nations has God, had gods too. Didn't seem to help them very much, did they? Is your God any different than those? And later on, this same Assyrian commander, he sent a letter to King Hezekiah saying the same sorts of things. Don't let your God deceive you, he said. The other gods couldn't protect their people and yours won't either. So, so if ever there was a time to panic for the people of God, it was now. We learned that there was nearly 200,000 enemy soldiers surrounding what, in the grand scheme of things, was the little city of Jerusalem. It was just another stop on the way for Assyria. This was overwhelming odds, overwhelming opposition. But instead of panicking, Hezekiah, this godly man, he does the only thing he can think of. He sees his weakness the weakness of his nation, the weakness of this city. He does the only thing he can do. He turns to God for refuge and for strength and for help. He takes his overwhelming problem to God and we have this prayer he offers to God recorded in chapter 19 
verses, starting in verse 14. It says, then Hezekiah took the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And he went up to the house of the Lord and he spread it out before the Lord. The, the letter that, that encapsulates the problem that he's facing. He spreads it out before the Lord. Verse 15, Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord, the God of Israel, who are enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone, not only of Judah, not only of Israel, of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see and listen to the words of Sennacherib, the, the king of Assyria, which he has sent to reproach the living God. Truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have devastated the nations and their lands. And they have cast their gods into the fire. He's just, this is reality of the situation. They have done this. For they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. So they have destroyed them. Verse 19. Now, O Lord, our God, I pray, deliver us from his hand that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, O Lord, are God. And do you think God answered him? His holy city. Jerusalem is under siege, just like is being described in Psalm 46. And God heard Hezekiah's prayer. And he answers this prayer through Isaiah the prophet, who was around at that time. And he says in 2 Kings 19, verse 32, Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, this is God's response, he will not come to this city or shoot an arrow there, and he will not come before it with a shield or throw up a siege ramp against it. By the way that he came, by the same he will return, and he shall not come to this city, declares the Lord. Why? For I, God is speaking, for I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. And what happened? Verse 35, then it happened that that night the angel of the Lord went out and struck 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when men rose early in the morning, behold, all of them, all of them were dead. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and returned home and lived at Nineveh, just as God said he would do. And this is what the psalmist of Psalm 46 knew. He knew that God has the whole world in his hands. That God's people do not need to fear because when God acts, it's over. And his people are safe. He acts on behalf of his people. When he chooses to act, no one can stand against him. Nothing can stand against him. When he protects, no one can threaten his people. God's presence is our security against our enemies. It's not strong walls. It's not military tactics. It's not well-trained armies. But it is, it is the presence of our God. That is our security. It's a fact that the psalmist affirms in this powerful refrain of verses 7 and 11. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Think about that just for a moment. It's an amazing statement. The Lord of hosts is with us. Yahweh Sabaoth is with us. It's one of the most commonly used titles of God in the Old Testament. It's used some 240 times or so. The NIV translates it as the Lord Almighty because it's a term that comes from the battlefield. The hosts are, are the hosts of heaven, the myriads of angels that do God's bidding. They are the warriors of heaven, the armies of heaven. He is the Lord of the, all the armies made up of angels of heaven. He is the Lord of hosts. So that, that title speaks of God's sovereign might and power. Might and power that's unequaled, even, even unimaginable. And yet, this God who has such power, such might, who's so high and lofty and exalted, yet he is 
with us? This God, the Lord of hosts, is with people, people like us? Why? Because he is the God of Jacob. In other words, because he entered into covenant with people. He entered into covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He chose a people to be his very own, to give his promises to. He chose a people to be his own possession out of all the nations on earth. And he entered into covenant with them. And so this psalmist, he doesn't take confidence in his, his own goodness or in his own righteousness, in his own strength, in his own courage. He takes confidence in God's faithfulness to his own promises. He takes confidence in God's faithfulness to his covenant that he made with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob. And so the same almighty God, Lord of hosts, that covenanted with Jacob was also his God, was a God who was with him, who was with his people. And you know, in just a few minutes, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together, where we remember what Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to do for us and given his life for us. And you remember what Jesus said on that night when he instituted the Lord's Supper with his disciples. He said, this cup, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. You see, we are part of this new covenant that God has made with his people, with his church, ratified in the blood of Christ himself. And so we have God's sure promises that he is our refuge, our strength, our very present help, that he is our stronghold, our mighty fortress. We have his presence, which is our security. And the reality is that we need his security because we are faced with opposition every day. We're surrounded by enemies all the time, even when we don't realize that. Yes, Jerusalem was the, the center place of God's presence with his people when Psalm 46 was written, but now God, by his spirit, dwells with us, his church, scattered all over the world. But still, Satan is seeking opportunities to assail us. Our great enemy is seeking ways to oppose God and, and threaten his people any way that he can. And sometimes, sometimes he opposes us through, from outside, through persecution of the church. And sometimes, more often, it's more subtle, perhaps more subversive, where he might plant people into the church who are going to lead God's people astray, or he, he's setting up this world system that will distract us from God and from the work that God would have his people to do. So we need to be on our guard. We need to know our enemy's tactics. But we have to understand that in the end, our security rests in God alone. We will not be moved. His people, his church will not be moved because God is present with us. We can't be strong in ourselves, think we're strong in ourselves. As Paul told us in the scripture Craig read earlier, we have to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. That's how we gain the victory. That's how we stand against our enemies. It's in God's strength. It's knowing that God is present with us and his presence is our security. Well, that leads us then to, to the final point and final picture that the psalmist gives us where we learn that God's presence is our peace for he will be victorious over all. And he really gives us in verses eight through 11, two exhortations the first exhortation, look to the future. Look to what God will do. Verses eight and nine. Come, behold the works of the Lord who, is right, who has wrought desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots with fire. 
the picture here is really a picture of the ultimate victory of God in battle or in war. Now, in, in the immediate context, it's very possible that God's people were literally under siege, surrounded by their enemies. And the psalmist is saying here, look to the future. Look past those enemy soldiers. Look past their spears and their bows and their chariots and their siege engines, those things that they would use to threaten to destroy us. Look beyond those things to tomorrow when, when the morning dawns, when God acts on behalf of his people. But in fact, he actually goes further than that. Look beyond even this local deliverance that God may bring. And beyond the one after that, and beyond the one after that, and look to the end of what God will do. You see the scope of what he is saying? Look at verse 9 again. God makes wars to cease, how far? To the end of the earth. God will put an end to our seemingly endless wars that we wage against each other. One day, God will put an end to wars. One day, God will break all the bows and cut the spears in two and burn all the chariots with fire, those implements that we use to wage wars. God is destroying those things so that there's coming a day when God will put an end to all wars and will establish peace throughout the whole earth by his power and by his presence. So we look to that future day. And as we look to that future day, when God will establish his peace, it should cause us all to do something now, unbeliever and believer alike. It should cause us to be still now. Cease striving, he says in verse 10. Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Cease. Stop. Be still, you enemies of God. You unbelievers, stop fighting against me, God says. Stop fighting against my ways and threatening my people and acknowledge that I am the sovereign Lord, that I will be, not might be, I will be exalted among the nations, all the nations. I will be exalted in the earth, all across the earth. And for you to fail to acknowledge that can only mean certain and eternal judgment. Be still, you unbelievers. But it also applies to God's people. Cease striving, be still, you people of God, stop striving, stop panicking, stop going other places. Come to me. Stop looking for refuge in some other place. Find refuge in me. Stop going to others for strength. I am the strength you need. I provide your strength. Stop looking for help anywhere else. Ultimately, I am your help and your refuge and your strength. Come to me and know, know that I am God. To know that he is God is to recognize his power and his presence and his commitment to you so that then you will again commit yourself to him. To know who he is is to recognize that he will be exalted in all the earth. It's to have confidence that the, he is the God of all the earth. He made all this and he will do exactly what he has said he will do. And he will establish finally peace throughout the earth. To know that he is God is to acknowledge that he is God. There is none like him. There is no other. So this promise of peace, of God's victory, over all the world, over all his enemies, one day should give us peace today. The ability for God's people to be still, to cease striving, to know that he is God and he is my God. He is our God. So for the psalmist, God's presence, and it should be for all of God's people, that God's presence is our, our confidence, 
our security and our peace so that when trouble, disaster, strife, famine, personal adversity and opposition comes, our hope is that God is present, that God is with us. And though, and though God, of course, was present with his people when the psalmist wrote Psalm 46, the people of God still looked forward to another day. Isaiah looked forward to another day when God's presence would be fully realized among his people. And he wrote those words that are so often repeated around Christmas time. Therefore, Isaiah 7, 14, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with birth, or will be with child and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. And Matthew tells us what that means, doesn't he? God with us. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, with us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And Jesus now, by his spirit, dwells with his people and in his people, in his church. And though enemies assail us on every side, we don't need to fear, for Christ is with us. Though pandemics swirl and politicians fight and nations go to war, we don't need to fear. The church cannot be moved because Christ cannot be moved. His true church, the true people of God, he keeps, he holds. And though personal tragedies, suffering, griefs, troubles come in all of our lives, so much so that it feels like the whole world is collapsing around us, yet even then, we don't need to fear because God is with us. Christ is with you and he never takes his eyes off of you and he will help you when the morning dawns. He'll not abandon you, but he'll keep you. He'll keep you and he'll raise you up on that last day to enjoy his presence forevermore. That's our hope. That's our confidence. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Can we pray? Our Father and our God, we thank you for your promises. We thank you for your presence. And though we fail in so many ways, yet because of your grace and your promises, you keep us and you grow us. And we ask you to continue to sanctify us, O oh God. Help us to understand, to believe that you are with us, that we do not need to fear. God, give us confidence in you. Help us to run to you for refuge and strength and help, knowing that you are near, that you are present, you are with us. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.